So the first thing I would do when you get one of these is don't power it up, recap the power supply, inspect the power supply, measure your voltages before you connect up to the board. Connect up to the board very carefully. You can get these around the wrong way. You know, you don't want to mess up the, you know, mix up the minus five and the, you know, the plus five in the ground. So if you look at the top right hand side of my thumbnail there, can you see the two jumper positions underneath? I'm going to unblock those holes. I'm going to stick a jumper on there and stick a little, uh, you know, jumper position. Um, just to make it revertible, I guess. Why not go with the same thing they've done with these, any of these jumpers where they're toggleable and stuff and removable? So we'll do that. Uh, and I'll stick a single pin on each end of the, one of these things here so that we can make those detachable as well, I think. Uh, this one down here you can see uh, 45th week of 1983 there. But most of, them on, most of the chips on this board seem to be 83 actually. So I would suggest that this was uh, manufactured in 1983, this particular one I'm looking at. So the single socket goes into the single pin. And the single pin goes into the single socket and those are just protected by heat shrink there so those can't get mixed up uh, and you know it's easy now to get that in and out Hi it's Gadget UK here again now following on from the previous video here we had a number of faults with this BBC actually um, and away I left it, we hadn't fully tested it, uh, there were things to do in terms of cleaning up the case and stuff, uh, I was going to test some games, test the RAM. So I've got the new VTI 2069 video ULA in there now, and uh, switch it on, uh, now you'll see we've got the same problem. Switch into the same mode one. You see, we can't see anything. There's something crazy going on. Um, so it would appear that the original video ULA is not the fault, actually. So I've just swapped out the video ULA here. You can see it's um, a VTI. That's who makes it. It's a VC2023. Now, the interesting thing is, this was kind of like the second revision, I think. Prior to this, there was the Ferranti one that began with a 5L something. I can't remember the exact part number of it, but the original Ferranti ULA has got super hot and had like a nice big black heat sink that's on top. Uh, these ones didn't seem to need it. They didn't get quite as hot, but this particular chip has been super hot since I got this system, and that was my first clue that there was perhaps something wrong with this. Now, as we saw, there was a problem with the graphics modes uh, 1 to 6, I think. Um, so I suspected this, I couldn't see what else it could be to be honest in the schematics there. There is a connection or relationship to the one of the octal, well two of the octal buffers there that uh, connect to, to the DRAM, but I don't think that would cause the behaviour we were seeing. So I've swapped it out with a 2069, so it's exactly the same, it looks like the same as this, it's got the VT, VTI as a manufacturer, but instead of a VC2023 it's a 2069. Now straight away it was beeping, you know, doing the normal two-tone beep thing, but a black screen. So I went away and did a bit of research because I'd read something about a wire mod you've got to do depending on the revision of ULA. So it turns out on this revision you need a wire between pin 1 on IC10 and it needs to go to pin 27 on this chip up here. So on the underside of the board, that little purple wire I showed earlier on, that was the factory mod for this revision of ULA. So I've removed that, and the other thing it says is to remove S26. Now, I've just put it in the left, you know, the west position, or what, if you like. I'm not even sure that is west or north. It depends which way you're looking at the board, I guess. But I've put it to the left-hand side there, and... Uh, I'll just show you, it is actually working. I'm going to get some heat sinks on that one in a minute as well. It doesn't get hot like the other one does, the other one gets super hot. But if we now go mode 1, and wait for the TV to sink, it doesn't always do that with the TV. There we go, you see, we're into mode 1. Mode 2, there we go, mode 3, mode 4, mode 5, Yes, this is sweet, mode 6, brilliant, and everything's working, as far as I can see. Well, you know what I'm like, I can never just rest and let things go. This is the old chip that wasn't working, and uh, I did some research, because I was trying to understand the differences, you know, the mod I had to do there was remove the wire that went from pin 27 here to pin 1 on one of these octal uh, uh, buffers or whatever they are here. Um, 
and it talked about the it's to do with the teletext inversion um, pin it's the output of the, the inverted teletext output or something so I then started thinking I wonder because one of the things it mentions you've got to remove this jumper completely and I started thinking I wonder if the, when I tested it in either position it, would, it was already on there you know it was already in one position and I just tested it in both positions in one position it wouldn't even boot what I never did was test it with it off completely I've just done that uh, and I used a little uh, crock clip thing here just to join up those two pins pin 27 on this chip to pin one on that chip on IC10 and it works so there's nothing wrong with the original uh, you know 2023 uh, video ULA which is fantastic I can now remove that sticker stick my heat sinks back on I'll pull the board back out stick the original wire back underneath and test it again Yeah, so it would appear if you've got the old, the original ULA, you don't need that little wire underneath, uh, and and the jumper, you know, is normal. Then you can use it to invert, or you know, if your normal positions there for either east or west on that jumper. But on the two o two three or the two o six nine, you need that wire. That's that's the key. Uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier down to this chip here. Uh, is it pin one? I think on this chip here. Uh, but the jumper needs to be off. If you've not got the if you've got the jumper on in either position there you can have problems in one position it won't boot and in the other one you get uh, in weird dark coloured text in anything other than the default mode. And the other thing worth pointing out whilst we're looking at this as well, you can get a replacement for this, a modern replacement actually. Um, a chap I've been speaking to on eBay has got um, a version he's created himself using a CPLD, um, and it's an enhanced version of the video ULA. It gives you control over the palettes, so you can actually customise the palettes on a sort of per game basis. Um, you know, so you, you do need to load, a, you know, run a utility and load a, uh, some, a file there for each game before you load it to change the palettes. But it gives you flexibility there in changing the palette. But beyond that, because it's a CPLD, it doesn't get super, super, super hot like this does actually. And it's going to be probably, I would suggest, more reliable because of that reason. Um, so I'll have a look at that in a future video, I think. Um, the little resistor and the diodes, as I mentioned in a previous video here, just provide a, a supply, a voltage reference to this, actually, a second supply rail. Uh, and it's about 2.2 volts. I think that's probably a correction from the previous video. I might have said 2.5-ish or something. It's not. It's 2.2. Uh, we had a colour problem as well. So just continuing on uh, from that previous video here, I've been uh, I've just spent a bit of time going through some things here, and I'm going to cut a lot of this out. There's nothing much to show you, but I've been following the, the schematics here. Now, if you remember in the previous video, one of the things I did, if I just zoom in a little bit here, if I can. One of the things I did is, can you see that that link there where my thumb is? S39. Uh, is it S29? I can't remember. S39, I think. Looking at that, um, that joined up the. Um, chroma to the luma signal so we should have had colour and we didn't have colour um, so the first thing I did is remove this jumper and probe these pins and uh, we've got no colour so I backtracked a bit at this stage and I thought well, let's just check from this side onwards so I checked these uh, the outputs of these 74, uh, 74s here, 74L74s 74 going into these XOR gates here and I checked the outputs and we had outputs here we had inputs everything we, we had a lot we had some activity here you know, if we had a problem with one gate here, for example, you might lack a certain colour or have a problem with a certain colour. Do you see what I mean? So, I mean, unless the chip has completely failed, well, in this case, I think the first number of gates here are by, done by one chip and these are another chip. So, even then, you know, if one of these chips had failed, you would expect to see something in regards to colour rather than nothing. Um, now, the mass, there's like a, a clock here used to uh, probably create the colour burst frequency I would think um, so you know this is an obvious thing to check as well you know that was one of the first things I checked before I checked these XORs and the, the flip-flops here the 7474s four, seven and everything you know we I had activity all the way along here and I traced it just now all the way through this inductor which is I'll show you see it it's just here where my nail is it's a little red component just stands up a bit activity there so I followed it uh, through through this inductor, through this cap, all the way to this transistor, and on the emitter here, nothing. And on the base activity collector, we've got supply. So I think that transistor is the culprit, actually. It's a BC239, it's Q9. So the next thing I'm going to do is swap that out.
Uh, and I can show you that on the scope actually if you're interested. Let's just look at that now. And if you're interested, Q9 is here, so the legs are fairly easily accessible. And the capacitor that couples the signal is down there, C58, and that was the inductor. So if we have a look at uh, the first pin, I forget which one this is, that's the uh, collector, can you see it's a high, like 5 volts high. Uh, yeah, that's the base, can you see those little weak pulses there? Probably a volt or so, I would guess, something like that, maybe a bit less than a volt. And on the emitter, that's the emitter nada, zip zero. So, yeah, I would suggest that it's that transistor actually. Oh, joy, faults never end on this beat. So, I didn't really show any uh, soldering or desoldering on the previous video because I've covered it so many times. If you wanted to see examples of how I removed the chips and things on this in part one, just check out the uh, Dragon 32 video, or the, in fact the one before, it was perhaps a better one, the Commodore 64 uh, video I did uh, there, black screen. Uh, so the, yeah, the profile is these uh, three pins here, a little triangle. So all I'm going to do is uh, just add a bit of solder to each of those uh, pins there. They're super hard to work on these because there's so many components clumped up in these areas here, where these transistors are, that it's really easy to lose track of which component leads to which leg when you flip the board over. Um, I'm fully expecting I'm going to remove the wrong blooming thing here, but we can always just resolder these if they're not the right points. So here we are. Um, so just using the trusty desolder pump here. I could use the desoldering station. Um, desoldering stations are so cheap these days. Actually, I'd recommend if you're going to do anything, uh, you know, you're going to do lots of repairs to these old uh, eight and sixteen bit systems. Get yourself uh, a desoldering station. Um, the one Miss Mad Lemon showed on her channel actually uh, looks pretty good actually, it's good value for money, it's not a particularly expensive one, but it does a really good job, it looks pretty good quality. Um, but as you can see, the technique here is just to you know, heat them for long enough so that the solder flows on both sides, uh, and then just use the desolder pump, and we'll just brush that uh, down. <sighs> Inspect closely because you can e easily have shards of solder joining links and you know linking up things there you don't want joined. Um, but in theory, that should now come off with a bit of manipulation. I might need to heat the odd pin while I pull the component from the other side, but that's all there is to it. So just testing this now. I've got it on diode test, and um, what we're looking for is there should be two diodes when you test a, a transistor like this. She should have a reading of. Uh, sorry, I'm going to block the uh, meter there, aren't I? So there's nothing that way. Nothing that way, so straight away, you know, there's nothing. Uh, so check that one. Nothing there. So got nothing that way around. So let's just flip the probes. So as I say, we should see two diodes. We've seen none so far. So we've got nothing there. Nothing there. There's actually nothing. This transistor is not doing anything, actually. I'm sure I had a diode reading a minute ago. No, there's nothing. That transistor's absolutely faulty. Uh, so we need a new BC239. Uh, uh, I'm bound to have some of those because they're quite common actually. So I just wrote some basic here. Uh, I'll show you the can. It's flashing. So yeah, set a barrel lay to zero. Changing the colour to that. Printing the message. Incrementing the colour. Going back round again. Uh, and as you can see, if we run that in that mode, we can kind of get all the colours of the rainbow. Well, more or less for that mode. Uh, let's try changing to mode 4, run. And I'm just testing out each mode here to see what I can see. Let's see, like mode 4, I'm only seeing two colours there actually, um, which is strange. Um, and that could be correct. Let's try mode 5. So I think the next thing I'll do now is just go around and clean the board up, just give it a general clean actually. I'm just going to use cotton buds and Q-tips. Um, the underneath of the board I did just briefly brush down before with some IPA. Uh, one thing I'd point out when cleaning boards and things like this, I've seen people using those, you know it's like a little can with a, a nozzle on the thing and you press it and IPA comes out and you just move the brush around and stuff. Those things are all fine and well, but all you do is you move the dirt around. You've got to be using something like this, or kitchen roll, or doing the board, you know, tilting the board at an angle and pouring something over it. 
and generally that doesn't work very well unless you're, you're brushing at the same time as tilting the board with a volume of IPA or something running off the board. You know, you don't get the dirt off. You know, can you see that dirt there? If we just used a, a brush on there, all we're doing is brushing the dirt around. It looks clean, it looks super clean, unless you, you know, look closely, you'll see the dirt has accumulated in certain places. IPA does not make dirt disintegrate and vanish. You've got to, uh, you know, collect that dirt with something, which is why, like I say, you'll always see me using cotton buds. Um, an ideal solution is, uh, you know, an ultrasonic, ba ultrasonic bath or, you know, a dishwasher, God forbid. I wouldn't suggest using a dishwasher. Some people use dishwashers, but actually it's, uh, it's not a great way of uh, cleaning boards up, really. Uh, and the other thing I'll point out while I'm here is, you may see on some of these chips, and you can see, can you see, I've been putting like a, a, light, a green mark with a permanent marker when I was testing them, just to show which ones I'd tested. Uh, a sticker might be an idea uh, when you're doing something like that, if you're trying to keep track of which ones you've done. Or, just print off the diagram and put crosses through on the diagram of anything you've ruled out. Um, but, you know, I will clean these up now, I may as well get rid of the green marks, you'll see, you know, the green ink just comes off there with a bit of IPA. So I'll go over them with uh, a paper towel and some IPA when I'm done, just to get rid of those green marks, because there's no point in that being on there at this stage. So it could probably be a bit cleaner in places, but it's not too bad actually. Uh, I've had a good going over. The difficult parts really are where you've got these little packs of resistors, especially all up here. You know, I mean I've used a brush, but if you do do that, just be careful um, you don't bend any of these so that they're touching. You know, a lot of these diodes and resistors and things here, they're very super close to each other. You don't want to uh, inadvertently, let's say, join two together. Especially here, I mean look at this area here, it's crazy how tight it is, uh, and over here as well. Yeah, but for the most part it's come out fairly clean, it's just in the very corners and things you can't always get the dirt out. Uh, you can see when I replaced this chip here I used a bit of flux on the solder, on the top side here and some to solder braid and it's all it did is you just removed the solder mask so we got a, bit, a few silver traces there but there was no damage there. I think I had one damaged trace under the 7.4 LSO4 here just because I got a bit impatient with it but I just put a little patch wire it's dead short underneath, there's nothing really to see there. But everything else that came off, including this chip here, no damage traces, no damage pads. Um, we're just waiting for the 74LS245N, I think it is, for down here. Um, so then this board will be complete. The only port I'm going to be able to test initially is the user port. I'm not sure which one that is without flipping the board over. I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times before. Put it, put it on a flat metal surface or something like that and just roll it. And as you can see, the profile strained out about that. So that should now mean that we can easily get that in there uh, and I am wearing uh, an ESD wrist strap there we go so now everything seems to work we've got all the chips on there we've got a good video ULA we've got good colours uh, well I think we have I'm not like I say I'm not familiar with the modes the different modes and what colours are available and what the numbering system is for the different colours and things it seems a bit crazy to me uh, just from some of the modes I've looked at, but that could just be my memory of the BBC. I honestly can't remember <coughs> some of the modes I used when I used to program BBC Basic when I was nine. So I think the next thing we'll do is I'll pull the board out, I'm going to clean the inside of the case, we'll clean the keyboard up, uh, and I'll start screwing things back in. One thing I'm really pleased with was doing this mod here. It just makes getting the board out super easy. So as you can see, the insides of it are pretty dirty, so I'll just get some uh, soap and water on it. Oh, look at the dirt. Good God. That's cringeworthy. My goodness. Yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, I could take the power supply out and wash it in the sink, but I don't see the point. I'll be able to get all this dirt out of here like this. Oh, look at that. It's horrible. So there you go. Our base is all cleaned out and shiny, uh, so I can get the board back in there. I'm giving them underneath a clean here as well actually, uh, just using soap and water, I mean I could probably use IPA on this, I don't want to because it, it might discolour it, it might move some of this print, uh, although I doubt it. Uh, yeah, you can see the serial number was removed from there at some point, I could always clean that up with some IPA, it must have had a, a stick, one that's stuck on perhaps. Uh, it seems to be a common thing with these because they were all in schools, you know after they uh, stopped using the beeb, a lot of them were kind of just given away, they were sold to staff or sold in auctions and things, sometimes just stored in storerooms and then years later 
uh, you know, someone found them and either skipped them or gave them to charities or nearby computer shops and things like that. So that's basically what ha seems to have happened with a lot of the Beebs. Uh, and that's often why you'll see the uh, school names uh, removed from the front, you know. Uh, I mean, either that or they were stolen from schools, but you know, I, I, there's so many of them like that, I seriously doubt they were all sold, uh, stolen from schools. I think it was a case of uh, many of them, uh, like I said, were just sold to staff and things like that. That's what I think happened. I do know, I, I know of at least two people who got one that way actually. He used to work for schools and uh, when these things were decommissioned years later, they were sold or given in some cases to staff members. And I'm just using a bit of IPA here now to get rid of these marks because, uh, yeah, they weren't coming off for some water, but they are coming off. Can you see that? It's like a yellow. Uh, there's lots of dirt coming off with the IPA here. I'm uh, amazed actually how well this is working. So the serial number glue removed with a bit of IPA there, and I'm just going to get some of this uh, silicon on there. Just because it gives it a nice uh, glossy shine back, when, especially when you've used IPA on plastic like that. Look at that, that looks sweet. And we've not covered the power supply in this particular video, but I will be going in there at some point. I'll do a recap of the main board, the logic board. But we'll take the power supply to bits as well and just show you some of the common issues you get with them perhaps. Uh, the nice thing with these is, like I said, they've got um, auxiliary power as well, you know, for any mods and expansions and things that you may need to, uh, you know, you want the BBC to power. You've got your, uh, you know, additional supplies and things here. This outputs for 12 volts as well, even though 12 volts doesn't go to the board. So just getting the screws in, some of these have got washers, um, and in certain situations like this here where the screw may overlap traces, you know, what you don't want is when you, as you tighten it up, uh, tight, you don't want it to damage those traces, shorten anything, so that's where the washers are useful. Um, the funny thing is I've only got two washers, should this have had five? Um, I suspect it might have had more than two. So I found one of Ali's uh, old LEDs here, you can see it's got a nice little chrome fascia to it and it just fits perfectly. So I'll uh, solder some wires on with heat shrink. I'm going to use one of these here, a detachable, so I can just dis disconnect it, but ultimately it's going to be plugged into the board there, and uh, just dropped with a resistor of some sort. I just need to calculate the size, I'm going to do that with the power supply now, just work it out. So let's get some solder and flux on there. I might as well show you a bit of the soldering, I've not really shown much of it on these videos, the BBC ones. Turn the resistor, I've got some heat shrink down here, which I'm going to slide up in a minute. Uh, I've measured... I've just gone from uh, testing with this, I tested with a 2K8 there with 5 volts provided and tested the current and there's about 10 milliamps I think. Uh, well according to my meter there is. So we'll just uh, heat that uh, now with it soldering iron. And all we're doing here is just applying some heat to you know shrink the uh, tube in there. I could use hot air, you get a cleaner job with hot air, yeah, it's going to move around a bit until it's shrunk to grip. So I've got a nice uh, chrome LED there, it is lit and it is pretty bright, it's just a super bright day in here. It's uh, about the same brightness as the caps lock and uh, the other LEDs on there actually. So with the keyboard here, you could just use a keycap puller, you know, they just pull straight off there, pretty easy. You know, you've got to pull them upwards like that, you know, in a perfectly straight line. You don't want to go at an angle because you could break, uh, you know, either the cap or the key there. But I'm just going to take these off one by one, clean up underneath, clean the caps up individually and, uh, you know, put them back on as I go along, I think. Yeah, I decided that was a bad idea. These are so bad. I mean, look at them. They're absolutely filthy. You know, they've had uh, an awful lot of use here. Uh, thousands upon thousands of children uh, at some point have been uh, typing on this, and yeah, goodness knows what bacteria and stuff we've got there. Some of these are harder to get off than others, but you can see how dirty it is on here as well. I want to vac up that and then clean that separately. And these... Uh, this is, usually I'll just go over them individually, but these are so bad, I'm just going to go soak these in some oxy action actually, just leave them for an hour. Um, that should get most of the dirt off I think, and then I'll just uh, inspect each one as I dry it and put it back on. Behold the power of TAED. So whilst those keys are all soaking, we'll vacuum this off now.
So that's the vacuuming done. Uh, what we've got left now is just some stuff that's stuck on here, you know, like up here. It's just dirt, actually. So I can go around the uh, edge uh, of the uh, thing here with uh, some uh, kitchen paper and uh, IPA here to get that dirt off. And then I can use cotton buds uh, to go up and down, try and get in gaps and things. But most of it's going to come off that way, I think. Uh, I've removed the microphone mount here so I can get some uh, paper towel under there. It's kind of glued down onto the PCB, so I don't want to disturb it. But what we can do is back the top. And the other thing we can do here is just spray some soap and water onto uh, a paper towel or some soaker cotton bud. Uh, and just clean it with a cotton bud actually. I wouldn't use IPA because uh, you may weaken uh, some of the adhesive that's used to you know, uh, produce these speakers. But just dampening this like this. See, you can see the dirt coming off there. Uh, yeah, dampening it's not a problem. It'll dry out super quick. So there's my keys, all had a soak in uh, Vanish Oxy action, uh, and they've come out super clean actually. Um, I don't think there's any dirt remaining on them. If you just put them in soap and water you'd have to scrub them, but I think that yeah, the Oxy action has just removed everything. Uh, but the main thing is you need to, you know, obviously rinse them. So I did the, you know, I had to rinse them one by one under the tap. Um, and then uh, they need to dry. Well, it's as long as it is wide, actually, cleaning them all at once, you know, obviously you don't have to clean them, but then you've got to either leave them for ages to totally dry out, you get moisture in there, even when they've been left for an hour, you blow in there, you can feel moisture coming back at yourself. I mean, it's clean water, but nevertheless, it's an absolute pain, you know, uh, and even just, you know, getting some uh, tissue in here like this and going round first, it doesn't resolve it, you get all the moisture out of there, but it's the moisture inside that cross, and even when they're upside down like that, the moisture stays inside it through that like, vacuum, if you like, of its own weight, holding it inside, so when you tap it, you get these giant blobs of water. <sighs> so it does take a fair bit of time uh, doing it this way, I guess. I mean, if you could leave it for 24 hours, it may evaporate, especially if it's in a warm area. You could use uh, compressed air, but, uh, yeah, I mean, these have come out fairly clean, actually, well, very clean. I'm not having to wipe anything off them, but as you can see, there's moisture in them all, and it's a really hot day in here. They've been sat around for an hour, and they're not drying. So there we go, that's all the keys back on. Uh, I guess it's a testament to how well these were built and designed, actually. The fact that these keyboards have been so resilient over the uh, decades. You know, like I say, thousands upon thousands of kids would have used these in schools, uh, and it's remarkable, really, that uh, they've survived so well. You know, they really have put the test of time. So I'll get a bit of uh, back to black on there, just because it makes uh, plastics like this look super new, actually. Sweet. I think you'll agree, that looks pretty much good as new. I mean, it's a shame these little bits here, you know, it's like paint come off the mask behind. You could touch that up, but to be honest, the, uh, you know, shape of the case and stuff masks that anyway, so you don't see it. But yeah, that looks sweet. And in case you're wondering, these uh, Rainbow Islands uh, dip switches uh, down here on the keyboard, not all the keyboards have this, this multicolored uh, dip switch here, but you can use this to set the default video mode and uh, floppy drive timing settings, I think. And if you get problems with one of these, you could always, you know, desolder the switch, you know, take it off, maybe try and disassemble it and inspect, uh, you know, or just replace it while you're there. Uh, it's worth just checking the solder points on all these uh, whilst we're here as well, they all look good, I don't see any problems there. And looking at the top here, you can see there's just four ICs on here, um, and it's just 7-4, logic is three there, a cap, another cap, I'll swap that out when I recap this in the next video, uh, another 7-4 logic chip over here, and another cap, and a few resistors, I think it's three resistors down there as well. So I'll clean this next. From the inside of the case, you can see, you know, it just it's flexible this, so you can just unhook one side, uh, and then it comes out. And we'll use a little bit of uh, Meguiar's Plastex here. Uh, bear in mind, when you get to the logo part here, you don't want to focus too long on there, you just want to just be really gentle over that. Um, it's printed on this side, I think, yes, yeah, so you're right on that side, and so we'll start on that side, but that should just bring off any marks, you can see some dirt just came off there, actually, as we got up around that part. But we'll just go over this and uh, give it a nice polish up. Now, before we put the clear piece back on there, we'll just clean up the black mask around the outside here as well, you know, because you can see it's a bit dirty. This was designed actually to put keyboard overlays, you know, you stick a piece of card under there that has the, you know, the functions of what these function keys do here. Yeah, you can see it is pretty dirty and that's not the black paint coming off, this is just soap and water I'm using here. 
it's uh, just very dirty. So I'll just clip that back in on that side uh, and then just hinge it in over this side here. There we go. Sweet. So I think the next thing I'm going to do is try and fix this. All the other pins seem alright. Uh, it's just the one down here that's missing. So there's numerous ways I could approach this. I could just get another one of these and recrimp it. Uh, and that's a fallback, you know, so if this doesn't work I can always do that. The other thing I could do is solder this into another socket so that it's got a decent set of pins uh, and then just solder this single wire here to, you know, the relevant uh, pin here. That's a possibility. But in the first instance I'm going to have a go at hacking this actually. I'm going to uh, try and snip. You can see here, just really carefully snip into this. Try not to do anything to that pin next to the pin we're dealing with uh, and we'll try and if we can break off the piece here to expose uh, the contact if we can uh, and then we'll just try and solder a wire on and you can see I'm going to be able to probably snip at an angle there I think now careful not to snip my thumb off yeah see so a piece of plastic's come out there <clears throat> so we'll just keep at it there uh, just until we get a little bit of that leg exposed because there will be a bit of leg underneath that. So there we go, you can see the stub of the leg there. Now the red wire, it looks a bit deceptive, this is the second wire there that goes to that. The red wire goes across through to this side and you can see it's crimped for that one there. Um, but what we can do now is just, you know, tin up this uh, old resistor leg here, you know, it's been chopped off resistor. Uh, tin up the thing there and just join it up like that, super careful. Uh, and then it should at least work. As you can see, I put a tiny bit of solder and flux there. I've tinned up uh, the end of the leg here. So I'll just uh, add a little bit more solder here, I think. There we go. Uh, and then just simply try and hold it as straight as possible in terms of alignment with uh, the other pins. It's a bit hard to do because of the three-dimensional aspect of this. In fact, we'll put it side on, slide it into the solder there, just get a bit more solder because that's quite a small blob there. I think that should do. Yeah, so it's a bit wobbly. I could stick some epoxy around that just to support that area, that's a possibility. And there we go, as you can see the pin spacing is pretty good there. It's got the same height as the other pins, the same sort of thickness. Um, it's just a question of whether it needs anything to support it here. Uh, but it should be okay, that should actually fit into a socket okay now I think. So just plugging this in there, uh, try and get it uh, aligned correctly with regards to pin 1. Hang on. Yeah that's it, um, push it in, yeah it makes a nice firm clip there actually. You can see the uh, LED uh, wires there as well. So I'll just mix some uh, two type epoxy here, this is uh, Haroldite. Uh, we'll mix it on this I think. Uh, we don't need a massive amount, just enough for the case post. That's probably enough actually. Uh, and a little bit for the inside of that little plastic lip that's hanging off. Because it broke off completely and I've, what I've just done is uh, hold it down with some tape on one side, on the front side. Make sure it's in the perfect position there. Uh, and then what we'll do is carefully with a jeweler's screwdriver apply a little bit of this on the underside yeah so there you see there's the tape to temporarily hold that in place can you see it's in exactly the right spot I mean it's you know it's not gonna to be totally flat but I just want to try and salvage that little bit before it breaks off um, and then up, and then under here you can't even see it you know it looks totally uh, like it's joined correctly there all I'm gonna do is you know drip some epoxy on the underside of that lip there uh, just to support it on both sides and once that sets that thing shouldn't uh, break back off again easily and the other thing is this uh, case post here which had broken off from there in transit so I've got a little bit of epoxy there and uh, as you can see I've put some epoxy around you know underneath that post stuck the post down and then uh, streamed it all the way on the outside so we just need to let that uh, go hard now that's going to be ooh, I don't know 24 hours overnight job whilst I was waiting for that MMC device you know the little SD card solution there I thought, I really want to play something on this, so I thought, well, what can I do? Maybe I could play a game from ROM. So I went away and found a couple of games uh, that were already on in the ROM format. Someone's converted them. One's Arkanoid, and the other one's Killer Gorilla, which is a clone, uh, a con, can't even say it, con clone. Um, 
and I burnt them to a 27C256. Now I didn't have any 27C128s which is the standard source size 16K that these seem to support but I figured you know it's going to be the same pin out it's just this additional pin here for the upper address line that selects between the you know lo lower 16K and the upper 16K so I've stuck both games on here you know I've merged the two ROMs together so I've got a 32K uh, ROM file uh, programmed it here to the 27C256 now I tested it with the all the pins in and Killer Gorilla just works fine but yeah, I might just solder a jumper on there and just have a little pin header and I can just toggle between which one I want at any given point and just leave this in here for testing for the moment. Um, I'll get a label on there as well. I've got tons of these 256 chips actually and not very much to use them with. I think that they came from ST upgrades. I think one of the, I could be wrong, I think in one of the um, ST revisions you've got to have six of these there to give you uh, you know, a TOS upgrade if you want to go to TOS 1.04. Behold the world's fudgiest fudge fix. Uh, as you can see, what I've got here is uh, a little jumper uh, connected. Uh, as you can see, the centre pin's connected to the upper address line on there, so that we can toggle between the upper 16k and the lower 16k. And then the top pin's uh, just connected straight to the VCC. Uh, and then the third pin down here is flowing away from the edge there, and it's got a small wire just coming wrapped right around the side of the chip here to the ground at the bottom. Uh, I mean, I can tidy that up a bit, I can uh, crease that wire in there just to make it nice and tidy. Uh, but the idea now is, like I say, we can toggle that jumper, um, you know, toggle that pin there, the upper address pin, between high and low. So I'll stick it in this end slot here. Uh, there we go. I'll get a label on it in a minute. And if I point with the screen, all being well, I won't show out my supply. And if we type at H dot. There we go, so we've got all arcanoid, so let's try that. Press any key. Oh yes, sweet. And if we switch it off, and um, we'll change the jumper over to the other position carefully. And we'll do that H dot again. Oh. There we go, killer gorilla. Oh yes, fantastic. And this ROM's useful for testing actually, I could take this out and stick it into another BBC, um, you know, a quick way of loading some software if you've not got access to tape or, you know, disk drive etc. Uh, one thing I do need to do with this Beeb is quieten it. I might have to, I might have to stick a resistor in series with this because the speaker is just way too loud. My wife will absolutely have a uh, a seizure, I think, if she uh, comes back and uh, hears how loud this BBC is. You know, it's a bit crazy, but I'm thinking, let me switch this off because it's too loud. I'm thinking I could use this port here for a little uh, potentiometer sticker volume knob on the back and just use that, wire that up actually. You know, it's a crazy use of that hole, but then again, I've seen people, I think Dave Curran blanks over those, you know, sticks like a plate on the inside to stop dust going in. There's no point in having a reset there, you know, it's easy to just press the brake key to reset the system, I guess. I mean, that might not re can be a complete reset, I've got no idea, but I don't really see the benefit of having a reset switch. I'll never use it. Um, it's just going to mean, like I say, I'm going to need to extend these wires or some of the speaker wires and run them through a pot. So just temporarily here, I've been testing with this, as you can see, just in series, and obviously I can turn it right down. I can turn it up. What I thought is, if I work out, uh, I get my scope onto this and get the exact uh, volume level there for line out using this pot, I'll probably stick a wire from under, from somewhere on the board where the speaker connector goes to, and on the back here, I, I'll probably fit a phono connector. I think I'll just see if I've got something suitable to fit there. I'm trying to think, yeah, I think I might have. Uh, so that way I can run audio out at line level and connect that up to the TV as well, actually. And then I can use the volume on the TV. Um, and I could then just leave the speaker disconnected. That's probably a slightly cleaner way of doing it, I think. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, my RCA jack fits quite nicely there, actually, with the washer. So that looks okay, and I could just take a label on it, audio out. So whilst we're looking at the sound area here, I thought I'd just talk about the sound generator here. When you switch it on, you get the 
first tone and then the second one and the first one is variable. Did you hear that? Yeah, a few people said that that's normal. From looking at the schematics, what I think is happening is this chip, there's no reset signal goes to this chip at all. The output enable uh, and sort of select signals uh, are tied low all the time. So by default this chip is always in an output enabled state so it's capable of generating sound right from the minute you switch it on more or less with no reset. There's a clock goes in there but the um, uh, right out uh, sorry right enable pin to this chip is connected to one of the VIAs there so it depends on whether the, the state of that particular pin if that pin uh, f you know, flickers a bit as the thing powers up, you know, when the, before the system has been reset or it starts in a low, which it may well do from boot up, then it's going to be enabled and it's going to pick up any noise there, if you like, that's on the, the, the data connections that come to it. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to output sound regardless. And then the second tone comes from the initialization, you know, as the 6502C is booted up, it's run some code from the ROM somewhere in the code there. It's going to initialize this via the, the v VIA to do the standard tone, you know, the standard start tone, which is the second tone. So, yeah, totally normal. Um, but that did alarm me to start with, you know, thinking oh, I've got a second issue with that. But no, there isn't. That's, that's how it behaves. And I think that's one reason why if you switch it off and on like that super quick, it's still got its initialization values. Can you hear the same tone? It's initialized the same as it, the last sound that went through it, if you see what I mean. If you switch it off, leave it off for a, a longer period of time, you'll get either a more, a more random, or if you leave it long enough, you'll get the default tone. See, it was a bit vibrating there, but uh, yeah, in general, if you leave it off longer, you'll get the more recognizable tone that I seem to, I associate myself with the, you know, the power on do do. There we go, sound coming out of the TV. I'll show you what I've done, it's a really fudgy mod. Uh, I can improve it later. So you can see there on the washer, that's the ground, just joined a little black wire to the nearest ground point down there. 1K resistors drop it. I can encapsulate that in some heat shrink in a minute. And I think what I will do is uh, use a shielded wire rather than just a single wire. So I've got this single wire coming across to the cap where the audio normally goes to the speaker. As you can see, speaker's just disconnected for the moment. I can just leave it like that. So the other thing I'll be doing with this is building an RGB cable. I've got all the components coming on the way. I've got the SCART uh, socket already and stuff. But what I was thinking is what I could do is uh, I'm on a SCART lead going into the DIN that goes in the back there. I have an, uh, a Fono, uh, an RCA that flies off and goes into it so I can tap the audio from there for the SCART lead as well. So I'll be sort of killing two birds with one stone. Sorry, cats have a massive Barney there. But what I will do is, like I say, use a shielded cable there. Even though I'm going to have, only have one core connected effectively, and I'll still have this ground here um, to, you know, to help with the noise and stuff. But I'll have it grounded at the other side as well. And that should just mean that the cable, it'll, you know, will uh, not pick up any sound, any interference and stuff. But I think you'll agree that sounds pretty good actually, and the volume level's just right. That's just right. That's spot on. Fantastic. So I thought I'd have a quick go at this. Uh, it looks pretty good actually, with Donkey Kong Clone. Uh, I'm an expert at this already. I need to get a joystick, I think. Uh, I did buy one that could probably modify, actually. It was the same one that I used to use with my PC years ago. Uh, cheap quick shot one. But it looks like it'll be just the ticket. Oh, I've got to wait for that ladder to come back up now. Sweet. Level three. Wow, I'm doing well. about the jump in here because that looks like it's too close. Well, that, why won't that thing go away? Where's it going? Where have the lifts gone? They've all disappeared. 
Oh, the cup. What the? That's crazy. It's too close to jump to. I'm guessing you just jump over the gap. I don't know. So Anthony over at RRG pointed out that when this was sent, it was in one piece. Uh, and I thought as much because I'm sure I looked at the photos quite closely that sent and all the case looked perfect to be honest I was impressed at how uh, perfect it was um, So I had an inspection inside the packaging and found some of the bits as you can see here Now not everything's there. It seems like some small bits seems to have just gone I don't know. I think they've come out of the box, you know there's, you know, it's been thrown around and there's been a little small hole in one corner and a few bits have gone missing But I found these little bits here which correspond with uh, this down here I think you know I could in theory stick that back there like that I mean it's gonna look a mess but uh, I might stick a piece of vinyl over there I've got I've ordered some matte vinyl um, but the flatter that area is the better really for the vinyl so yeah I might just I mean that's sticking down actually with, with the, the sticky stuff that's already underneath it you can see that's stuck back down I mean it, you know you really would need to glue that back on to hold it in place but can you see yeah, so I'm going to just press that one down there. Can you see? That's not bad. But this one here has got a little bit of a, a tear there as well. So, yeah. But, I mean, again, it's not too bad. Uh, it's just a shame I've got that piece. If I've got that piece, I'd be uh, feeling a bit more positive. So, other than these small bits here, which I'm now going to try and see if, if there's anywhere these will fit. But there was inside the package in there, these two pieces. So, I've glued a little bit in there. Uh, and then this here, you know, so there's a little gap there um, so yeah, it's not perfect it's not perfect at all, but it's better than it was, now when it comes to the plastic filler, I mean I can what I can do is just smooth over here with a bit of plastic filler just to you know, fill any of the micro fractures there that shouldn't make that nice and smooth and then I can fill this bit in super easy with plastic filler you know, because this, this whole extended lip here would have been a pain I'll show you if you look on the underside here this would have been a pain to replicate, you know, in its entire length. I would have had to do it in sections, you know, because the, the way you do things like this, I've shown before, is you have, um, you create a mould, so you have a piece of card, you know, uh, pegged, if you like, to here, this area here, so a piece of card extended out, and then you've got to do something on the side, on the inside, this lip here, again, a piece of card pegged, to give you a little narrow channel there, and then you can fill it with plastic putty, let it set, and then move a lot of pegs along, and do the next bit, the next bit, the next bit. If you try doing it all in one length, you know, the, uh, the unless you've got like a really stiff mould there, you know, you can't use card to do that, to give you that channel. It uh, would be a really wonky uh, thing, but you could do it in sections all the way until you get to the end. But now we've got this extended piece here, it's going to be super easy to fill that bit. Uh, and then we've just got this corner here, and obviously a small corner over here to deal with. Those will be far, far, far easier to deal with now. So, uh, yeah, I'm grateful that Anthony pointed that out, and that went back in the packaging there to look for those little bits. Because they were hard to find, uh, if I'm honest. You know, they were stuck onto the bubble wrap, and they weren't very, very visible. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be all right when I'm done with it. Well, surprisingly, I've been able to stick a little bit more plastic there, one of the little pieces. And you might not be able to see this, but the very edge piece here, where my thumbnail is, that's just been stuck back on there. So we've closed the gaps considerably there, actually, and I stuck a piece back in here. Now it's not as it's not as level as I would like because. The way it's broken, it's just meant, you know, it's super hard to get back together. So you can see it's stuck out. Can you see it's stuck out a bit down here? But what I can do is just smooth that down. And the little, tiny little nick there, again, that very small gap, I can just get some plastic putty in there. But I think you'll agree, that's a lot better than it was, you know. Um, it's considerably better, actually. So it's just these corners. Uh, you know, those are going to be super easy to fill now with a bit of uh, plastic putty. Uh, and I say I can just smooth this bit down here and uh, you know correct this a little bit, not a problem. So this is going to look a mess. It's bound to to start with, uh, and it's going to look a mess when it's finished. But it might look better than it did. So all this white here, that's not going to be white. A lot of that'll just wipe off. Actually, um, it is easy to get this stuff off. Um, you know, if I just wipe that with a rag with some IPA afterwards and just rub over it, most of that white stuff will just come off, and it'll just leave any little gaps filled. Um, this corner here, you know, it's again, it's just a mess. The idea is to try and start to structure it. So we've got, you know, just a bit, bit, bit of a blob there, 
and I'll go over it again afterwards and then again and then again and then just you know scrape out the inside here to make it uh, round on the inside smooth the edges off uh, and you know this corner will build out you know you can see it's not quite a corner at the moment uh, and it's the same over this side here that one's a little bit better actually but again can you see it's sunk in a little bit there so again I'll go over that once that's set and the, the white marks and things will come off and we'll just uh, you know any, like over here that'll just wipe off yeah that'll just wipe off uh, so what we should be left with is just the corners looking a bit white like that now what I could do then is get some uh, cream coloured paint and just paint them might do that actually rather than spray the whole shell because um, it is just going to be the corners there's this whole extended white area here you're not going to see that it's not going to be white like that um, and again you know I'll smooth the inside here a little bit because it's not very even and I'll go over that a second time as well but this is all just uh, you know building up layers here to get the right thickness of the lips and things the bits that were missing uh, the corners in particular so as you can see here I've started to uh, smooth this down all I'm doing is using IPA on this part here and you can see it's left the, uh, the the middle bit filled there where there was a split but it's removing off the excess and that's the nice thing about this technique so we'll have a, a fine white line there but it'll be smooth you know you could always repaint over it but all I'm interested in is getting a smooth edge there. You know, if there's a little bit, a little bit white over here, not that, not like that now, but just a tiny little bit where there was a gap, and then the corners are a little bit white. I'm not bothered. Uh, I could always just mix a cream and uh, paint those little bits. Uh, that's one way of doing it. But yeah, I mean, you've, it takes time. You've got to be patient, stuff, and careful. But as you can see, you know, that it's smoothing it down uh, and bringing it back a nice level, smooth surface. So you can see I got rid of the overhang here, um, you know, because one piece didn't go quite in perfectly. Uh, that's pretty smooth there now, actually, that area. See that? It's, yeah, it's pretty straight. Uh, and it's smooth. Yeah, we've got this white bit here, but it's smooth. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do now is just fill this corner in, uh, you know, here, because it's still a bit flat there. On the inside, it's not too bad. Perhaps I need to shave a little bit out of the corner there and shave it down a little bit there so it fits the case. Uh, and on this side, it's uh, a similar thing. It just needs padding out, you know, a bit more filler sticking on the outside and smoothing down. But as you can see, you know, if you look at the uh, edge there, it's well, it's pretty flat. It just needs a, a light file there. So after drying overnight and being sanded down very gently, can you see that? Uh, and the seams here have been filled in uh, and again around this side here a nice perfect corner as you can see it's uh, I've done a super good job of that actually I'm amazed it's not showing up very well on the camera but it's perfectly smooth absolutely smooth it looks if you sprayed that up I touched it up I might uh, touch up some acrylic paint I've ordered some uh, cream acrylic paint and I might just just touch those little bits there and I bet you won't be able to see it and if I'm super careful with these bits here again I'll uh, have totally masked that damage and the post under there I've tested that with a screw it'll screw back together it's uh, firmly holding in place that no worries at all and on the inside all I did here after I'd worked on the outside smoothed it all down just use this tool here when it's partly dry after about two or three hours uh, and it's a kind of rubbery and you can just like you know edge away at it like that to make you know the perfect round edge in there uh, and to separate it because it was a bit thick here you know but as you can see it follows the contour so just using the tool while it was drying let's say after about two or three hours a bit rubbery and you just you can scratch away at it and uh, manipulate you know to get it away from the edges there so that you've got the cavity for the bottom half of the case so we've got our small strip of black vinyl down there just to straighten that edge I mean this piece has been glued back in uh, you know I could stick something over there but I'm gonna leave that it's only a little chip um, but I think the other thing we'll do is why not cut a piece of vinyl there because you know this has been scratched and someone's put black paint or something on there can you see that where the original school name would have been there and over that scratched up area there, I was going to put a piece of this, you know, mask it off. But then I thought, why don't you stick a nice silver label? So this is, I don't you can see, it looks white in here, but actually it's silver. Uh, and just as BBC Micro Model B. But it's just covering up that really super scratched up area that was uh, underneath it. Um, 
I still need to try and get off these little pink marks here. You can see maybe it's had a stencil or something put there and then someone's dragged something over. Uh, so we've got a bit of pink here, but I can get rid of that. Uh, super easy, I think. And I probably should have done this before I stuck a label on, but you can see most of it's come off there, actually. There was a giant uh, streak of it here. Most of that's come off. It's just a case of just a bit of IPA, a bit of friction. So briefly summarising what I learned about this particular fault, you know, the, the initial fault we had with the data bus. Um, the first thing I would do if you get one of these where you've got a, a data bus fault there, you know, you've looked at the data bus, the address bus, and if you've got all highs there, remove the CPU. Have you still got highs on the uh, data bus there? You shouldn't have highs on the address bus at that point. So if you, if you do, that's an indication you've got problems with the address decode and logic somewhere. But if the data bus is still high with no CPU there, at that point you want to start removing chips. Now, uh, I mentioned four of the chips there in the previous video there in a, a black page of text you know there was just like four chips that I talked about um, but there's more than that actually any of these ones here that are socketed remove them remove them all the only VIA you need is this one here this one down here is for your disk interface and stuff so you can remove that it will boot without that but the one up here is required for the keyboard you know and the keyboard runs through there so you, you absolutely need that if you're still getting no joy swap your VIAs around that's a good always a good test anyway in any system if you've got two chips the same swap them around see if your behavior changes um, but yeah any of these socket chips that are socketed you can remove but yeah this chip I had to desolder because it's socketed but in the service manual it suggests removing that one as well these two are socketed I think one's for your ADC uh, it might be this one here I think and the other one's a serial a serial controller chip here it's like a serial ULA so you can remove those those are irrelevant and I guess you should also remove any ROMs apart from your OS ROM because you know as you saw at the end of the last video near towards the end there you only need the OS and it'll come up saying you know language question mark you know so that's all you need to get a boot up really so when I was trying to make sense of the ordering of these the, these ROMs here in terms of how it identifies what, what's where and which slot, somebody, I'll stick his name up here, suggested that there's perhaps a, a byte somewhere in a header. Uh, and I, that went away and looked it up, and actually there is. That's exactly how it works. You know, the, the ROMs for the BBC here, there's a, a header, specific header structure, you know, and a byte that identifies what, you know, what type of ROM. So Acorn built in a header into these, you know, a, a number of bytes to ident identify what kind of ROM it is, what CPU it belongs to, uh, you know, uh, whether it's an OS ROM or whatever or a language ROM so that's how that works uh, and I think somebody else uh, pointed out that the rightmost slot here has got the highest priority um, so you know it's a good idea generally to have your basic over in the right hand slot but it will pick it up from somewhere else you know that's not a problem so just a quick tip here, and this is something I've long since forgotten, but if you press control break, that does a hard reset, and if you press shift break, hold shift down after you've pressed break, it will boot, you know, if you've got a disk in the disk drive or something, or like in my case, I'm using a, a Supra SMC or a Turbo SMC, it will boot automatically. And there's going to be lots of mistakes I made amongst these videos, actually, because, you know, the BBC, like I say, I haven't touched one of these in 30 years or something daft. Um, but, yeah, the buses down here, you know, the expansion connections and things, the tube interface, I think, might be 2 megahertz. I think I might have referred to it saying, you know, when the CPU slows down to, uh, to 1 megahertz, <coughs> maybe to read the tube. I don't think so. I think the tube's 2 megahertz because there's a 1 megahertz expansion bus as well. That's where your 1 megahertz kicks in. But your 1 megahertz also, you know, it goes, it drops to 1 megahertz for the, the VIAs, for uh, some of the ROMs, you can have slow ROMs, um, your serial, your uh, ADC, your analog to digital converter there, and various other things. And the slots over here for speech, actually, uh, one of them is for a speech generator chip, and the other one's for a ROM that goes with it. Now, the ROM's got some custom functionality, and it's not just a ROM chip, as far as I understand. Um, so I've ordered a couple of those, so we'll have a look at that in a future video, I think. And the sound for that is actually merged through an op amp or two down here to go out with a normal sound out. You know, you can see for the moment I've got the speaker disconnected, but you, you, the sound will come out of the standard audio output uh, stage there, as far as I understand if you've got these, uh, you know, sockets filled here. So in the next part, we'll take a look at uh, the RGB cable. I'm going to build an RGB cable for this and we'll test that out because there's no telling whether that side of things is going to work. It'll be interesting to see what difference, uh, you know, picture quality comes out like. We'll have a good look around the case as well. I'll show you, you know, how it turned out with regards to the bits that I filled in and stuff. Uh, we'll also have a quick look at uh, a Turbo or uh, Super, as it's called, Super MMC. Um, but I'll cover that in a video in its own right. I think I won't go into too much depth, but we can just test some games out, see what games and things look like on this, other than the, the couple you've seen in this video. Hopefully, you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.